Okay, we are recording. Ed, how are you today? I'm all right. I'm kind of running around like a, a headless chicken because I'm sort of, we've got two new kittens. So I'm sort of constantly, I'm letting them roam around. But then our third cat, who's now a, a rather sort of chonky six and a half, he's kind of, we can't have them in the kitchen and it's all a bit like hectic. But on top of that, I'm sort of trying to finish some rough mixes for someone because I record a lot of different random people coming through the studio um, and then uh, in the wolf cabin. And then, yeah, and then just got, I've got um, my fellow bandmate Cass Brown from Luke Guru. He's yeah. in the studio right now. We're working on our second record. So, so yeah, it's all kind of like just constant struggling a lot of things, which I'm I'm fine with. I quite like it. So Lovely, lovely. Well, we, we met many, 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 many years ago, Ed. You will not remember this uh, at all. But my band played with your band snug um at the beetle bug jam at the santa pod racetrack um probably god 95 maybe 96 no, would have been 96 probably or 97 yeah yeah, yeah. and wow. uh, uh what was your ba- which band was it, what was your band uh we was called lilo and, okay uh, cool yeah and so uh yeah we uh we, we 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 was all hanging out i think it was us and news and i can't think of else was playing but uh i uh I'd, I'd i'd been buying your cd so i was i was looking forward to hanging out with you so uh so yeah we have met many 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 moons yeah, ago yeah my mate. god that's a that's a long time ago <laughs> oh wonderful god, yeah. back in the back in the day when uh, things were a little simpler oh absolutely mate absolutely well, Ed, let's kick off your playlist. I'm going to ask you for track one to tell me the song that you regard as having the greatest ever intro, please. Okay, so um, this is a record that my I've got two older brothers, and this is a record that my brother had on vinyl. Mm. And uh, for a couple of reasons, really. Um, the second one being quite extreme. <laughs> the first one, the first reason is, is I remember, you know, when I started first started getting into music, I would kind of, I would sort of pilfer their record collection and rifle through all their vinyl records, you know. So I had they had everything um, from uh, Jane's Addiction to The Doors to to you know Creedence Clearwater Revival to Beastie Boys to whatever, you know. And I stumbled upon the record uh, Maggot Brain by Funkadelic, and um, and I just remember seeing the cover and thinking, this looks pretty mental. Um, sort of woman with an afro buried buried in the dirt. Yeah, and um, and so I put it on, and um, it just uh, it was kind of like it started. It starts off quite gently, you know, and I and I was just kind of like, whoa! And then it's just when that lead guitar kicks in, I was like, oh my god! Like you know, just goosebumps on my arms, and and I just it's like wow, you know, and um, became quite obsessed with it really. And uh, I, but the second reason is that they played at Glastonbury. Mm. and um i think it was 2013 no 2010 and it was on the sunday and i'd been there since the friday and i have to say if i'm going to be truly honest i was a little bit um three sheets of the wind yes if you <laughs> i mean if i'm going to be honest i may have i may have been on something hallucinogenic yes and we went to we went to the West Holt stage, I think it was, Funkadelic were playing and they started with that track. Yeah. And we sort of went right by the speaker and then the guitar and I was kind of like, oh my God, oh my God, I'm seeing it live, you know, I, this is amazing. And I'm like, am I allowed to say this on the podcast? So wherever you want, brother. I was basically tripping my balls off. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so I was really tripping and the guitar solo kicked in and it came out the speaker and I reacted so violently I projectile vomited <laughs> against the speaker like literally like oh like like literally like against the speaker with loads of and I was just like because the reverberation and the sound of yeah. the guitar coming I was so close to the speaker that it just like physically made me <laughs> sick and I just was kind of like that's my reason for choosing it as the greatest intro because of the violent reaction that I had to it. Ed, I've done 512 episodes of this podcast. No one has ever chosen a better reason. 
<laughs> to choose a track than that. That is fantastic. And very much in the in, in the spirit of uh of Funkadelic. It's it's yeah, that's pretty fucking crazy, man. Yeah, it was pretty nuts. Um I just and weirdly, you know, I remember it as well. Yeah. Quite clearly, you know. Yeah. So um that was quite that was that's my re yeah. I was thinking about it last night and you know, there are so many incredible intros. So many. But that one just kind of it's so epic and it's so long and it kind of so it's kind of like it really it kind of gives you the sort of you know what what you want you get your money's yeah. worth you know so with that in mind you said you know obviously that's a i mean it's about a nine minute track anyway but you know a big part of that is that sort of long intro you mentioned um that you know you, you there's a studio where you are now and you've had bands coming through and stuff now when you first started making music um you know in a band and, and as, a, as a as as a solo artist um the way that people get their music is way different to how they get it now. Uh, and so in regards to sort of intros, you know, we, we're seeing things like TikTok becoming used in the industry, uh, which is, you know, wh whatever your thoughts are on it, it, it is artists are, heritage artists are now getting their songs reheard because of it and, and other generations are getting it. And also, I, I guess rather than trying to get on the evening session now, it's about getting on the right Spotify playlists and such. That's, yeah, that's very true, yeah. So, uh, and, and I guess that maybe the TikTok thing maybe leans more towards maybe commercial pop music, however you want to look at it. So yeah, where I'm going with this is, as an artist, when either you're writing and also if you're producing for uh, uh, somebody else, mm. do any of these kind of, changes in how people are consuming their music filter through into because with, with, with the tiktok thing everything is seems to be getting smaller and smaller quicker and quicker short retention spans and with spotify in a world where you're not just going to a record shop and there's the top 40 singles there's an infinite amount of music and it's getting heard and getting dragged in yeah and so does any of this stuff filter through into your creative process as a songwriter and as a producer i would say absolutely not <laughs> Okay. I would say I would say I'm not I'm not aware of it. I'm sort of in my own world, and you know, um, like yesterday I was recording uh, Richard Strange, who was in the Doctors of Madness, and mm -hmm. a piano player called Clifford Slapper, who's a fantastic What's guy. Name? Yeah, brilliant name, brilliant guy. And so, you know, we recorded them, and um, I had him on the Baby Grand and Richard on guitar and singing, and everything was live in the same room with all the bleed and all the noise. And it sounds beautiful, you know? Yeah. And I think, you know, I will work with some artists where we'll be we'll be kind of like working on the song production wise, and they'll be like, Oh, I think we should have a breakdown here. It's quite kind of pop. And I'll be like, Okay, you know, I'm totally I'm not I'm not gonna limit myself, I'm not gonna be um a sort of holy India the now snob. Um but um I'm just not aware of it. I'm not aware yeah. of TikTok. I, I I totally understand that playlists on Spotify matter. But I'm not going to change how I make music because of uh, a medium that kind of promotes ADHD. You know, I just yeah. and I think you know people deserve better. And just because that that's just that that's you know those platforms exist, it doesn't mean that you should change your music. I mean, don't get me wrong. I like things to be snappy, and I like. Oh, sorry, that was my. I'll turn off my email. Sorry, I like things to be snappy um, and get to the point. You know, but. If a song warrants, like Maggot Brain, you know, a, a sort of four minute intro, then so be it. Absolutely. I think, I, I think you have to follow, you have, have to follow the um, the whim and the muse mm. of the song and how it sort of reveals itself. And you're kind of like, you're just along for the ride, really. So Absolutely. you can try and tame it, but, you know. Yeah. No one's ever heard 30 seconds of a song on TikTok and projectile vomited. Ever. No, it, well, hopefully, maybe I can, um, maybe I'll try and create something that could do that. <laughs> kind of like, I think I'd, I'd have to get some sort of like shepherd tones and brown notes, you know, mm. some proper sub harmonic. Yeah. You certainly get, maybe kind of get things rumbling in the stomach, you know, yeah. and then, and then maybe some really high pitched sort of white and pink noise mm. and just kind of combine all the, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, we'll see. I'll work on it. I'll, I'll... <laughs> That'll be my next sort of raison, raison d'etre for the rest of uh, 2024.
Okay. Ed, I'm going to ask you to tell me the first song you remember hearing that had an emotional impact on you, please. Yeah, so um, it was when, actually when I was about 18, and it was the opening track to Closing Time by Tom Waits. It was all 55. Um, and so basically I got really into Tom Waits around the time I was writing songs on the piano and because um, you know I'd been in snug playing bass mainly and and then I but I'm a piano player so I was kind of I sort of heard him and I heard Randy Newman and I heard Harry Nilsson and all these different 70s singer songwriters um, well when they started in the 60s 70s and um, but I heard Closing Time and then listened to Tom Waits's whole back catalogue and sort of chronologically but that was the first song that I heard and those sort of opening chords and it's just so melancholy and wistful. Um, I think the word is, um, I believe it's like saudade. I think it's like an Arabic word and it means something that's very melancholy or sad that makes you feel happy and warm. So it's it's just had that, um, I don't know. Yeah, it just, and my daughter sort of, when she was really young, used to sing, she knew all the words to that song. So when she, she I didn't even kind of, prompt her to learn it she started singing along whenever I played it on the record player she'd sing along and then she knew all the words yeah um, she doesn't know them now but when she was about three and that was also sort of doubly em emotional sort of yeah of course and, and be just wonderful and and uh, a sort of gorgeous moment you know for me so uh, to, to be 15 I mean the the, the aforementioned that the, the Randy Newman's um uh, uh, uh I, I understand that that's quite easy for a young lad to get into um tom waits is pretty heavy stuff isn't it for a, a, a young lad it's pretty abrasive in 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 many places like yeah. what was it that kind of struck you about well i think waits? you know i think i think it was the the period between sort of 1972 and 1981 i, I guess was the 82 that was his kind of uh romantic uh bar fly uh, Beatnik, Bukowski, Archer, if he was a uh, homeless kind of, <laughs> that was his sort of, you know, his, that was his, a decade of um, those records. They they certainly had a, they had a certain thread running through them that was very, um, very beautiful and romantic and dark and melancholy. Um, and, but his voice had changed over time, um, probably through excess and drinking and, disenchantment with the music industry and trying, you know, I think him and Springsteen started out at the same time and Springsteen sort of went stratospheric and Tom Waits just kind of, but it wasn't yeah. until the eighties, you know, that <clears throat> he completely changed his sound and went, went much more sort of, uh, you know, junkyard, beef heart, um, lots of mad instruments from around the world and, and mm. went much more surreal. And, and, um, and so that's, I would say that's probably the more abrasive he's, He's actually become more abrasive as he as he got older, which is yeah. which is something to aspire to. Um, I think that's fantastic, you know, because it's a bit like Bowie as well, you know, just kind of constantly, sorry, Bowie, Bowie. I never know how yeah. you meant to say it, but uh, you know, just constantly kind of trying to push push the boundaries and and objectively think out of the box and do something different, you know. Yeah. So that's inspiring. But it was that first initial song on his debut album that you know, and I, you know, just that really kind of got me. Yeah. What was, where was growing up and was home a musical environment? So uh, it wasn't that musical. I was sort of the only musician in my home. Um, but I started playing music when I was nine. And I just, my mother noticed that I was just constantly kind of quite restless and banging stuff quite rhythmically and um, got me learning the piano and then I just sort of started picking up um instruments um when I was about sort of 14 but we did have music playing in the home so my dad my dad's really into classical music he was in the army but he kind of like he likes jazz and but he has a few sort of folk records and um he also was, was really into Ravi Shankar so mm -hmm. he used to play um a lot of Ravi Shankar and then my mum had all like Johnny Cash and the Beatles and so we had those down. It was mainly my brother's record collection, but as far as music, we listened to music a lot. And my parents were really, especially my mother, was very sort of encouraging. So yeah. um, I had a, you know, I had a place to to read music at university, but I turned it, I sold my soul 
to rock and roll. Uh, <laughs> and uh, my, my, you know, I remember my fa- father saying, you know, he kind of said, you know, why don't you want to go and read music? And I just said, well, I'm not, not too keen on analysing it. I'd rather create it. So, yeah. Do you still do you stand by that to this day? I do. Yeah, I'm not very, um, I'm not great at analysing things. I'm not. I don't like to get, don't like to dissect things. I just like to sort of make things and then move on. Yeah. Um, I think you know because it's just always every song is a reaction to the last one and you just you, you you write the song and then I work quite quickly so I just like to sort of write it and then move on to the next <laughs> yeah let's stay in the formative years and uh, tell me the song that reminds you of your time at school please Ed yeah so actually that's uh, that ties into when I formed my first proper band which was Snug and we formed at school and we were really into Nirvana and Weezer and Green Day who we ended up supporting, which was pretty mad. And, um, but actually one of the, the one song that I remember, we just uh, played a lot. And we used to do these like shows at school, um, big, and we'd make a poster and put it up in the dining hall. And, um, and they used to, the rugby team used to put up the poster for, come and see the, the first 15, you know, and we'd like put the poster over the top and then I'd sort of, almost get the shit kicked out of me by a massive <laughs> by a massive you know rugger bugger jock type type fellow so yeah that was quite quite interesting but um the song that we played uh so much was undone the sweater song by weezer yeah. so yeah it was kind of like and i was playing bass so it's like ding 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 yeah and it was just like yeah and then i just remember i don't know why it's just like that's the song that's the song that we played like so many times it's like yeah it's like completely etched in my sort of muscle memory yeah um, it's a great single it's an amazing song yeah it's a great you know what a great band you know yeah. I, I love so much of what they've they've done and i love the the okay uh human record actually yeah they did with the sort of st- orchestra but um yeah that was just a huge and then we went to japan in i think 2000 and played Summer Sonic Festival with Weezer and Green Day. I mean, so we were give, kind of we were there with like our heroes, like you know, playing the same festival. It was crazy. And to give that some context, like how old was you then? So the, I would have been, I think I was like twenty two. Yeah, I mean that's yeah. fucking crazy, isn't it? You're, yeah, it's, you're it's mad. Yeah, we, playing your heroes. we signed to Warner's when I was like eighteen. Yeah. So I had my, and then you know we 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 got dropped after like three singles and. And then I just, you know, we all got pretty disenchanted. But around the time we went to Japan in 2000, literally that's when I signed to EMI for my own yeah. career. So I was in a hotel room in, in like Tokyo and I got a fax sort of shoved through under my door that was my contract that I had to sign. Wow. <laughs> pretty bad. I had to fax back my contract from Japan. But, you know, it was, but then before that I'd been, you know, I was quite, quite amazing to be disillusioned with the music industry at the age of uh, 19. Yeah, that's insane. Yeah, because I sort of worked as a chef after for two years. I was a sous chef, you know. But that gave me time to kind of ref- sort of kick back and start writing songs for myself. So, I mean, to to, to have a record you at eighteen, and and you know, you said about performing at school and stuff. Was you a confident kid? I think um, yes and no. I, I think I was because I moved around a lot. Like every two years, I was able to adapt. So I kind of like knew how to make friends quite quickly and easily was that because your dad was in the military yeah so I like I was always like going moving around when I was a kid and so I kind of would make friends quite easily and I was quite gregarious but I think underneath all that I'm actually quite sort of no one would no one ever agrees with me on this but I feel like I'm quite shy Mm -hmm. because I do go I I go quite quiet in in social situations and I don't know what to say but Mm -hmm. but I think a lot of it is like I have this drive that's like this kind of Maybe it's from performing on stage. It's, it's kind of, I put, I'm not putting on a personality, but I just, I sort of have this, I don't like awkward silences. I don't know. Maybe I'm like a, a, social, a social loner or something. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the confidence aside, like you mentioned drive there. Where, where's it come from? What drives you? I don't know. Um, I think, you know, writing songs, making music, there's a drive to connect with the world, with human beings. There's a, a total drive to relate, but there's also a drive within myself to better myself and to learn and to just try and make great art, I guess, yeah. in a way, in a fashion, you know, but, but there's, yeah, there's, 
definitely there's a sort of insatiable hunger to just keep moving forward and keep making music. And sometimes I, I feel like I burn out a little bit from doing it. And I just need to, I think I need to calm down a bit. I mean, you know, um, I might, I might, I might be, I get distracted quite easily. So. How do you know when you are sort of hitting burnout? Like what, what are, I mean, apart from you just mentioned that you get distracted easily, what are the, are the signals and are they things that you're aware of now and you kind of It's like right? this really weird experience, feeling when you know that you've written something great, if you or, or good, you, you, it's, it literally comes out of nowhere. It's, I've always said this, it's like this otherworldly sort of experience where it's just the words and the melody just kind of form and they're just suddenly there. And I've got like, if I show people um, my notebooks, there's some songs literally that I've recorded that's just like, like that, no crossing out, no editing. And admittedly, when I hear some of my older lyrics, sometimes I'm a bit like, uh, yeah, you could have, you could have worked on that a little bit. You know? Yeah. <laughs> but so I'm a lot, I'm much more of an editor now, but it's kind of interesting how, I think maybe that might have been, um, I was such a massive fan of like the whole beatnik uh, scene, you know, Jack Kerouac and, and William Burroughs and stuff like that. And when I read that Ker Kerouac used to, used to just have a massive roll of paper and he'd just have it attached to the typewriter and he just would just write completely sort of gut instinct, you know, just whatever came into his head, he would write it and there wouldn't be really any ed editing. It was kind of this flow um, sort of, uh, what's the word? Um, flow of consciousness. Yes, that's the word. Sorry, there's yeah. a flow of consciousness that just kind of just streamed and streamed, you know. And, and um, I think I sort of appreciated that because <clears throat> there's an aspect of writing and recording that is kind of like if you think about it too much, you if you start to know the song too well, then uh, I don't think you're going to get your best performance or your best writing. I think I think you it has to kind of really just you have to sort of expel it, yeah, 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 and, and then and then look at it later, you know, and and be like, actually, just let's let's take that out and add this, and I think that's that's the best way to create, I think, rather than being analytical and kind of very meticulous and taking yeah. your time, and you know, and a lot of a lot of people like that it becomes very sort of uh, clinical and technical, you know. Absolutely. Tell me the first song you bought from a record shop. Well, this is a difficult one because I'm not sure. And I wanted to originally, so like in the eighties, I went through a, a a very small phase of buying novelty novelty vinyl. So like I had like loads of money, Harry Enfield. I had Stutter Rap by Morris and the Miners. So somebody somebody dropped Stutter Rap last week on this very podcast. No way, <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. It was but Mark. Thinking, it was Mark Gardner from Ride. That's so. amazing. I just remember it so clearly, and I. I just was like, and I, you know, I love the BC Boys as well, but I was just kind of like, this is hilarious. So I went out and bought it, and I, I had that and loads of money. <laughs> I think I had I, I want your love, Trans Transition Bump, mm. but then I think the first sort of cassette that I had was Queen's Greatest Hits, mm. and so and the first song that I, I would say the first song, for me, it would be Killer Queen by Queen. Yeah. So I mean, just, just so amazing. I, I love Queen. I bought, you know, I'm, I'm uh, not shy about saying that. Yeah. What is it you love about Queen? Well, uh, first of all, the songs. Some of the songs are just unbelievably amazing, melody-wise. Freddie Mercury's way with the melody is just off the scale. Um, I love the way they sound as well. Like the production on some of them just sounds so, still sounds so like fresh and clean and uh, you know. Uh, and then. Um, I just kind of the showmanship, I think, of Freddie Mercury. Yeah. Kind of, I really appreciate that, and um, the sort of the pomp and the grandeur, you know, or the the bouts of delusional grandeur, <laughs> yeah, whatever yeah. you want to call it. I just, you know, um, but I think Killer Queen just sounds, you know, it's, as soon as it kicks in, it just it still sounds fresh to this day mm. to me. Um, but uh, yeah, Steve Gullick, the photographer, and I share a very mutual love of Queen. We're always talking about them. Love it. So yeah. Tell me um, a little bit about uh, your relationship, if there was one, uh, with a record shop. Was 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 buying records and hanging out in record shops ever part of your life growing up? Uh, yeah, so it was more like when I lived in London, 
Uh, I used to go to the Notting Hill uh, record, record exchange all the time. Mm. So I got a lot of records from that from them, especially when I started get, getting into Tom Waits when I was 18. I just went in there and I was like, oh, my God. They had like everything. So I just kind yeah. of bought, bought all, everything on vinyl. And then, uh, yeah, and they'd have like a lot of cool 45s and, and lots of punk and a lot of great hip hop as well. And um, so, yeah, that was kind of my main records, record store, really, that I went to. Um, bought a lot of records and now um now i kind of i live in oxfordshire my local oxfam is like insane it's got amazing records that there must be someone who's just like this sort of record pimp who just kind of keeps dropping obscure i went in there they had like a bootleg can vinyl oh, you know, cool, from, really? like, yeah, from like 1974 they had like noi they had like um Roberta Flack first take on vinyl. Bob Dylan. What? Like, yeah, they have like so much stuff, like really weird, rare stuff. And some of it's like it's fifty quid, some of it's twenty quid. But then there'll be like original records going for like nine ninety nine. I just I don't really know what's going on. But because mm. I have a, I don't know if you can see it, but I have a, a jukebox. Oh, um, love it! Uh, just there, and it's a Rockola from nineteen seventy three. So I put, um, I collect forty fives. And um, and put um, sort of swap them around. I make the little uh, strips and put them in. Yeah, love uh, it. Use, yeah, using and uh, yeah. So it's kind of like I've got like now about like three hundred forty fives just sitting oh. there, and it's an ever revolving. Um, and I've got everything from NWA to Sparkle Horse to Sam Cooke to to whatever you know. Oh, perfect. So yeah, so it's kind of like we're big on vinyl. Well, I am in this house, so so that's kind of. Um, I lo- what I love about vinyl is, you know, you it makes you listen to the whole record. You know, you put yeah. it on and you're forced. No, no one ever really gets up and tries to find the sort of groove of the next song. They just kind of let it play. Yeah. And I, I think that's 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 the um, the beauty of it. And a lot of the time you then pick the sleeve up and look at it. And like, yeah. Which, that which might. you don't get that on Spotify. You don't get that on your, yeah, on your phone well, when you look at a little bit of artwork. I think you might be able to see the credits now on Spotify. That was due to... I think there was like credit where it was a campaign called credit where credit's due i think but um that's so it's so important you know to know who how i think tiktok as well i think james blake is right in saying that you know it's created a, a sort of a generation that that they think it's okay that music's free you know yeah absolutely um absolutely. but you know now universal have sort of taken off they've taken off 80 percent of tiktok haven't they yeah, and they've removed it, so doesn't really affect me. So <laughs> I'm kind of like, what? So I'm um, busy here, like playing my weird old organ in the wolf cabin. <laughs> well, that sounds a bit rude, but you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, let's move forward a little bit to uh, to track five, and it's the song yeah. that soundtracked your years going out clubbing. So, like, I'm not I'm not really a clubber, but this is quite random. Um, when I was at school, um, we used to listen to, to quite a lot of drum and bass. And um, so I, um, my friends had some decks and we used to listen to Goldie quite a lot and LTJ Bookham mm. and uh, Inner City Life by Goldie. I remember having that um, on the decks and trying to kind of mix, trying to mix between the two different drum and bass records and being absolutely rubbish. But then um, I went to see uh, Chemistry and Storm in Brixton nice. uh, when I was quite young. Um, in the sort of nineteen ninety seven, yeah, and uh, that was uh, pretty mind blowing. Yeah, so it was kind of the metalheads and Goldie and that whole kind of. So I chose Inner City Life because that's kind of like the biggest, the biggest song from that era. Yeah, it me. still sounds so good, man. It sounds amazing. Yeah, it's incredible, and um, I think you know, drum and bass is kind of like it's never really gone away. You know, no, not kind of, at all. It's always still. It's a bit like a mullet. You know, <laughs> good chat. It's it's just it's never, you know. Yeah, it's just always been there, and um, well, yeah. not no, it's not always been there. But you know, it's incredible to also hear how um how got. I think wasn't it was it Goldie? I think he was talking about how he stumbled upon making the beat for Inner City Life. He, it was a mistake yeah. or something. He sped it up by mistake, and he was like, oh, you know, there's something in this, and and yeah. um. But it's just, yeah, it's 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 fantastic. So that's um, I haven't done a huge amount of clubbing. I got to be honest. Yeah, 
But um Oh, I've got my quote, mate. I've got my quote. Ed Harcott says rum and bass is a bit like a mullet. Oh no. <laughs> no, I'm gonna get <laughs> there's gonna be like a sort of um, uh, an extreme drum and bass aficionado <laughs> who's gonna gonna want my head on a plate. <laughs> This is, this, is, this is going to haunt me. I can feel it. Love it. Love it. Well, look, I'm going to take you home, and I'm interested as to what you're going to call home. Um, is it yeah. home now? Because for somebody that moved around so much, um, as you said about earlier, I'm going to ask yeah. you for track six for a favourite song from an artist from your home county, please. Well, I'm going to I'm going to choose the home county that I live in now, which is uh, Oxfordshire. Well, you've got um, some you've got some uh, beauties to choose from there, mate. I know it was a difficult one because you know some incredible. But I'm going to choose this one because they're my friends, and it's "Caught by the Fuzz" by Supergrass. So, also track. And Danny, um, Danny Goffey's, you know, he's like one of my best best friends. And Gaz, I'm really he Gaz lives like ten minutes from me, so we meet up sometimes. And and uh, I've toured with them a lot, and we we just you know, known each other for a long time. Uh, but um, every time I hear that song, I'm just kind of like, yeah. And it, I've seen it live like thirty times, and it's still yeah. always amazing. Um, and you know, Danny's a great songwriter. You know, he wrote that. Um, and um, both so and, you know, him and Gaz, incredible songwriters and musicians. And um, so yeah, I feel very kind of. I actually, you know, was started hanging out with them and became their friends because I was such a huge fan. Yeah. Of Supergrass, growing up, you know, in, yeah. the, in the nineties. So um, it was kind of like, whoa, you know, like sort of this is really weird. Um, but yeah, we just kind of. Um, our paths have crossed a lot and uh, that song never fails to uh, put a smile on my face oh, the, the energy that record has is oh, it's just, incredible it's ridiculous it's like yeah. it's almost like someone had reworked and reinvented like the early madness records it's just like it's got that urgency that yeah. social commentary and that, that yeah. sort of that youth about it it's, it's so exciting I'll... it's great it's, it's got that it's also got that element of, sort of you know teenage kicks yeah, yeah, absolutely. Tones, or 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 um or buzz buzzcocks, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's got that that same kind of like teenage uh, urgency. Yeah, it's it's just, but yeah, it's just, it's it's one of the best songs ever. Just written. a complete story as well. It's so from perfect, start to yeah. finish. That's it's, what I mean. It's so perfect as well. Like just yeah, like that. it's it, and it's so short and concise, yeah. you know. And, but it's you know it does everything that you need. Yeah. In the space of like two and a half minutes or whatever. It it, it was. Absolutely. I, mean, I was really lucky. Like, I, they used to do these things. Gary Crowley used to put these gigs on in London. I can't think what the show was called that he used to present. And uh, was it The Beat or something like that? And uh, and you'd get to see like sort of three bands for like about eight quid. And you get to see like, this is obviously in the in the sort of uh, early to mid 90s. And you get to see like suede stuff. But one night there was this band and these kids walked out. And it was like, who's this? And it's like, oh, they're called the Jennifers. And like... Oh, yeah. And like, and I was like, and then literally a couple of years later, hearing caught by the fuzz, I was like, "Fuck, that's that dude from that band that was like literally looked about fourteen when he was on yeah. stage." Like, oh, superb! That that first Supergrass record, he's he's just absolutely rammed with just pop gems. Yeah. It's it's fantastic. It's, and, it's an amazing record. Um, yeah, I think you know, I think they're all doing their own thing now. So that time has come, but um. But you know, who knows? Maybe they'll make another one. But um, yeah, don't think they'll ever. I don't think they'd be able to make another record like that because yeah. it's just of such a, a time in their lives. You know, of course, of course. Um, but I think actually, Danny and I are gonna. We might we might do some music together uh, in the next few weeks. So he's gonna come over here, and we're gonna. Oh, amazing! We, but it's quite. I'm gonna be. It'll, it'll be interesting because we're both such different songwriters. You know. So yeah. It might work. It might not. We'll see. I mean, you've been bigging up Danny as a songwriter, but fuck me, like what an underrated drummer! Like oh, it's ridiculous. He's incredible. Yeah, we we played together in um, in Paris. We did uh, Sergeant Pepper's. Yeah, uh, the whole album at the Philharmonia in Paris, two shows in one day. And uh, can you talk about that a little bit more? Because there was quite a few people involved in that, wasn't? Yeah, there? it was um, Pete and Carl from the Libertines, Steve Mason from the Beatles Band, and then we had um, Paul. Uh, Paul Kelly on uh, bass from the choral, a uh, little Barry on guitar, and then we had uh, strings, including my wife and some of my family, and and uh, some brass players. And um, I mean, that's some lineup, right? <laughs> it was pretty amazing. It was really amazing. And um, I do, I yeah, it was kind of like 
it was it was it was difficult. The the first show went without a hitch, but the second show was a little bit um dare I say Pete might have been a little <laughs> uh, yes. I don't know how to put it really. It's, yeah. He was he was sort of on a different cloud. That place where you was at when you threw up, yeah? Yeah, I'd say probably, yeah, on a on a same the same uh <laughs> same platform as that kind of <laughs> just just kind of just one degree away from the vomiting, I would say. <laughs> but um but you know what? It was really quite yeah, quite a special day and uh, the rehear just love the rehearsals, it was, it was so much fun. Um, but you know, it's quite quite a kind of big big thing to do, the whole of Sergeant Pepper's live, you know. Yeah. But we kind of we really went for it. And uh after the first show I had a woman come up to me and she was like, I saw the Beatles in the sixties and I love Sergeant Pepper's and you really did it justice, you know. So I was kinda of like, Oh, thank God, you know. Oh, that's fantastic. It's sort of holy, holy sacred ground, you know. But um But yeah, so anyway, Danny was playing playing drums on that and we of course I got him to do uh with a little help from my friends, yeah. you know, whilst doing the drums. And he, he smashed it, you know. Yeah. He absolutely smashed it. Um, so, yeah, although, you know, he looks more like Paul McCartney than Ringo. Yeah, so. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay, this is your last track. And uh, and this is where you get to be uh, a bit of a tastemaker. And it's yeah, a sure. song that you think many people may not know that you would like them to hear, please, Ed. Well, this is a song from, I think, the 60s uh, that... Or 70, I don't know when it's from, but it's a song that is very much like when I was on Heavenly Records, it's a heavenly favorite that we always used to play at about sort of, I'd always hear it about three in the morning when we were having a party in the Heavenly offices. And and um, it was which it's called Witch Tai Toe by Harper's Bazaar. Do you know it? No, it's really quite psychedelic and magical and weird. And it's got, I'd have no idea what they're singing about. Um, and there's like bicycle bells. Like sort of going throughout the whole song, it's it's quite something, and um, it just seems to be a record that um, everyone at Heavenly was obsessed with, and we just listened to a lot. And um, but it's kind of like every time I've mentioned it to anyone, they don't know who they don't they've never yeah. heard of it. But it's it seems to be this this song that kind of was within a circle of people that everyone yeah. was obsessed with. Um, and yeah, so that's my that's my final final number that I think people should hear. It's quite weird. It's quite dreamy and, and ethereal and odd and 60s psychedelia, you know. Well, we make it easy for people to go and uh, make their mind up uh, on that track because that, alongside all the other tracks that we we talk about, we put together a little Spotify playlist to oh, brilliant. the pod. So uh, people can go and uh, in, enjoy all of them. And obviously we'll put your music on there as well. And we've been talking about everybody else's music. So let's talk about what you're up to. Yeah, so I've got a um, a record coming out um, in at the end of March, uh, and um, doing lots of in stores and yeah, so I'm sort of gearing up for that really for the rest of the year. And uh, I'm going, I'm off to um, do a month long US tour with the Afghan Wigs and the Church. Oh, amazing! Yeah, so like, and Greg Greg Dilly, who's a good friend, um, one of my really good friends, is um, we sing a duet on the new album. And Catherine Williams, the singer, is doing some BBs, and I also do a duet with a great singer from Bristol. She's called Stevie Parker, and um, yeah, you know, so it's called El Magnifico, and I made it in the Wolf Cabin, recorded the strings in the local church after bribing oh, the lovely. vicar, and um, yeah, and uh, made it uh, a lot of it with Dave Azumi Lynch down in Eastbourne, who I work with, and and um, it's a sort of you know, again as always, a labour of love. Yeah, but uh, it's coming out of my label, Deathless. So I've, I've sort of done a deal with Integral, and I've got my own little kind of imprint um, with oh, them. Wonderful. So Deathless is one of the songs on the record. And uh, but other than that, I'm just going to yeah, I'm going to be. Um, I've also got kind of a few sort of. I'm getting into film film com- compositions. So I'm doing you know, I'm kind of really getting into that world, and I absolutely love writing music for film. So yeah. that's I feel like hopefully that's. If I can get my foot in the door of Hollywood, yeah, that's my that's my kind of that's my objective. You know. Wonderful. And so th- there's some in stores. Is there going to be a UK tour? Yeah, there's a uh, there'll, there's going to be a, uh, there'll be a UK. I'm playing um, the Ramblin' Roots Review in High Wycombe on April the sixth, and before that and around that, I've got like in store at Banquet Records on the eighth, and then I'm playing like Edinburgh, Liverpool, Leeds, 
Oxford truck uh, resident in Brighton. Yeah. So I'm just going to be driving myself around with a piano, with a electric piano, and love it. Kind of ro- rocking up. Um, and I think I may have a show on the 28th in Glasgow as well on my own. Okay. So. And if people want to keep up the speed with all of this uh, as to where they can see your uh, uh, releases and such, where's the best place to, to start to speed with you, mate? Uh, I guess probably my Instagram is the best place because uh, I'm rubbish. I'm really rubbish at trying to updating <laughs> stuff. I need like a PA or a, a micromanager or something. I'm, I'm not very... Um, I'm, I do try. I do try. Yeah. I have a website. It's um, edarcourtmusic.com. So I do update that sometimes. So... I'll probably put the yeah the dates up on that. Fantastic. Well, look, we'll uh, we'll tag you in here uh, on, on the socials when we drop this episode, so people aren't following you already, then they can do so, and Great. we'll put the, the the web address in the show notes so people can go and uh, check out the site. Ed, it's been lovely having a chat with you, mate. You Thanks too, so mate. much for giving up your time and, and coming on to talk records, mate. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Nice to you know reconnect after. <laughs> After, whatever, 28 28 years. Wonderful. I'm going to press stop, but don't go anywhere. Okay.